Okay, welcome everyone uh, to our third episode of Ammonia Energy Live. Uh, this is going to be a monthly series where we explore the wonderful world of ammonia energy and the role it will play in uh, global decarbonisation with a bit of an Australian twist. Uh, joining us today is Jeff Ward, CEO of the Hazer Group, and he's based in Perth. Uh, Jeff is going to be interviewed by Andrew Dixon from the, from the Asian Renewable Energy Hub project, as well as Darren Jarvis uh, from Intertech Pivot. Andrew and Darren are both founding members of AEA's Australia Committee. We encourage you to submit questions during the webinar via your questions box and you go to uh, menu. We'll try to answer the easy ones as we go, or if time gets short and the question is a good one, we'll save it for a future webinar. We're keen for this series to answer your burning questions and address all the topics you're keen to hear about. So please keep the feedback coming. If you can't make an event and it's a scheduled time, please don't worry. Register and you'll receive a link to watch the recording shortly after the event finishes. All Ammonia Energy Live recordings and episodes are also going to live over on our YouTube channel. Just search for Ammonia Energy Live or AEA Australia and I'll make sure to subscribe once you get there. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Darren. Thanks, Julian. And uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for joining us today. So, uh, for those you, of you, me. So, for those of you who don't know about uh, yourself and the Hazer Group, could you give us some of your history, how Hazer came into being, and what you do? Okay, so Hazer is an Australian listed company. You can find all our uh, filings and general information, you know, through the ASX platform. Our code is Hazer H Z R, but we're a uh, clean technology development company and our primary focus is commercializing the Hazer process. So the Hazer process is a low emission and we hope low cost method of manufacturing hydrogen from methane by producing two products, hydrogen and a graphite byproduct without producing a CO2 waste uh, in the production process. Um, it's an Australian invented technology. Um, the genesis of it was researched at the University of Western Australia. And in fact, the inventor and founder of Hazer still works with us as our Chief Technology Officer, Dr. Andrew Cornegio. And then the company has continued to develop the, uh, uh, the technology through further research collaborations with the University of Sydney, um, the Innovative Manufacturing CRC, and now with the support of ARENA, we're implementing our first demonstration project um, after a successful couple of years of pilot trials. So Jeff, I've always assumed, I mean, I've heard the, the name Hazer for uh, several years and I've assumed there's some brilliant mad inventor, a Mr. or Mrs. Hazer who's behind it. Are, are you telling me now that's not the case? Uh, no, um, and um, I, I understand, but this predates my involvement in the company, that Hazer is actually an acronym, you know, and stands for Hydrogen and Zero Emissions Research. And I think that was the name of sort of the original Western Australia a University of WA in, you know, engineering school research program that gave rise to the PhD that was at the foundation um, of this technology. So, you know, it's great to see, um, you know, an Australian you know, PhD thesis, you know, become commercialised through a university uh, commercialisation arm, then be supported by seed capital in Western Australia before listing and moving through piloting and now into demonstration. So a real homegrown, um, you know, venture capital and technology story. And hopefully another Australian success story, Jeff. So well, we can only hope, and we do hope. So tell us some more about methane pyrolysis. The technology has been around for a long time. What's different about Hazer's process and what innovations have you made? Okay, so I mean, it's interesting if you look at the process of technology development, sometimes it's about being in the right time in the right space. Sometimes it's about looking at a, you know, a new process in a slightly different way. Um, I guess you could define methane pyrolysis as taking a, a methane molecule, CH4, you know, one of the major building blocks for you know, so many petrochemical processes and, and splitting it. So you know, decomposing it, and, you know, thermal decomposition is another term that could be used to describe it. And you split it into um, a hydrogen molecule, or in this case, two hydrogen molecules and a solid carbon particle, which in our case, um, becomes laid down into you know, three carbon structures, a carbon micro shell, a carbon nano onion and a carbon nano tube. Um, I guess what's different about Hazer and what attracted me to the innovation uh, in this technology is that it uses iron ore as a low cost process catalyst. You know, if we go back historically, you mentioned that the technology has been around you know, since the 60s and 70s. 
uh, I guess if you went back to those sorts of times, you know, there wasn't as much focus on hydrogen. You know, it was often a very low cost or, or niche market, or, um, you know, or a low cost, high value market feeding the Haber-Bosch process for, for ammonia production relevant to today. Um, and the catalysts that were involved in decomposition were typically precious metals, nickel metals, palladium, platinums, or you know, complex alloys of those, you know, often on a ceramic substrate. So you had a complex catalyst, um, and typically with those complex catalysts, you then need to regenerate them now because carbon is a poison to them. And so you had a cycle where you were trying to improve the catalysis of, you know, of methane pyrolysis while defeating carbon growth. And so, yeah, the carbon has to go somewhere and they never really found the right solution to that. Um, to me, one of the really innovative things about the UWA research was they focused on a low cost sacrificial catalyst, you know, that was abundant in Western Australia, iron oxide. So we use uh, iron ore, iron oxide as a catalyst. We grind it to you know, around about 200 to 500 microns, so half a millimeter. Um, and that catalyst becomes, that powdered iron ore becomes our catalyst. Now, within our reactor, that catalyst further disintegrates into nano-sized uh, sort of shards of iron, elemental iron, and that becomes the, the, uh, the site of the methane decomposition, the breakdown, the release of the hydrogen, and the formation of the graphite around those nano-shards. Um, so I think it was quite innovative to look at what had typically been the problem um, in previous methane pyrolysis um, technologies, and now see it as an opportunity. And so I think what's different about Hazer is, you know, a low cost sacrificial catalyst. We produce a highly crystalline graphitic carbon rather than sort of the more amorphous carbons that have typically been produced in, in prior attempts. And so we think that there's more potential to add value to our byproduct than has previously been the case. Jeff, um, what, what do you see as the, the emerging market opportunities for your particular technology? And, and what are the, the niches that are really well suited to your particular technology and approach? Um, and this is yeah, really a, an area that's changing really quickly. I was talking to one of our directors last night and you know, observing some trends we're seeing in the European market and seeing there's been quite a change over the last one to two years. Um, I think to break that sort of question down, you know, the emerging end uses are as broad as all of the areas that hydrogen can play a role in the decarbonisation of transport, heavy industry and hard to decarbonise sectors. So if you look at the work that the World Hydrogen Council has done, you know, the real push towards a, a hydrogen economy and, you know, ammonia being both a carrier for hydrogen, you know, a, a form of you know, using hydrogen effectively is really you know, synonymous with that. Um, is that you know, hyd hydrogen can play a role in decarbonising heavy industry like steel, cement, petrochemicals, fertilisers, explosives. It can play a role in stabilising energy systems, so decarbonisation of gas pipelines, um, stabilisation of, of energy grids and a large form of energy storage. And it can be a direct replacement for diesel and transport fuel. Um, and it can be used you know, for city-wide, um, building-wide you know, combined heat and power. So it plays a role in advancing what's been done by renewables in all of those sectors. Um, so what that means is I think that the scope of opportunities is, is very, very large. You know. So you know, I could conceive um, one of the business models for Hazer would be operating small to medium sized Hazer projects based on landfill gas or biogas from wastewater treatment plants. And so creating intensely sustainable local manufacturing of zero or negative carbon emission fuel to be used in local fleets, whether that was the waste trucks, the school buses, um, or public transport vehicles. Um, and at the same time, then producing you know, a graphitic material, a graphite, which could go into local manufacturing opportunities, which has come from waste too. So green hydrogen and green graphite based on sort of circular economy and sustainable principles. That would be one great niche. Um, Another sort of a niche, which is not so much a niche, but the complete reverse of that would be embedding processes like Hazer, methane uh, pyrolysis, into steel or cement um, manufacturing or large scale industrial petrochemical complexes at, at mega scale. Um, and yeah, that's probably more relevant to some of your um, ammonia subscribers that you know, processes like Hazer can play a role in decarbonizing those in, you know, industrial processes where you know, supply of um, hydrogen from projects such as yours, Andrew, alone might be enough to reach those objectives. So the integration with Hazer and steel works or cement works, providing both 
Um, low emission hydrogen, you know, plus the carbon material additive is another really exciting opportunity. Is the sale of you know the carbon or the graphite uh, really required for the economics to stack up with the Hazer process, or is it just the cream on top? Um, I think that question partly goes to scale. Um, so you know, we see one of the clear advantages of the process is we produce potentially a, a high value byproduct. Um, and uh, the graphite we're looking to produce from our projects uh, initially will be around about 90% carbon. So it will need further refinement to go into markets such as you know, refractory um, or battery manufacturing materials, some of the re or electrodes, some of the really high value markets. But we're also seeing applications for it just as is. So you know, if, if I look ahead in the next you know, three to four years, then finding a market for the graphite is very important while we're operating at smaller scale. You know, we're still an emerging technology going from pilot to demonstration. And so our first projects will likely be of smaller scale and hence higher cost than the eventual point we, we expect to reach. Uh, but in the sort of the longer term future with very large scale hazard projects, you know, we are not dissimilar in equipment, um, energy intensity, temperatures, et cetera, the steam methane reforming, um, which has come down rapidly in price over 50 years as, um, as projects become much larger. So I could also see a point where our uh, unit costs are low enough to be competitive without the graphite sales, where the graphite just acts as a form of solid state carbon capture and storage. Hmm. So obviously, Jeff, the Hazer process is very different to a project like the Asian Renewable Energy Hub and the Pilbara, it still being gas based. You've given some view there about the potential for the technology. What role do you see the, I guess, future of gas-based technologies playing in the energy transition? Um, I, I guess we see the energy transition, and I, I, I think this is sort of a fairly commonly held view, is we realise that um, for the speed of transition we need, for the size of transition we need, uh, we're not going to end up with a one-size-fits-all. and you know. So we've made a real point that we see ourselves in, you know, in collaboration uh, with large scale electrolysis you know, and projects like you know, Andrew's project up in the Pilbara, it's Pilbara Energy Hub, and certainly not in competition to it. You know, it's the potential that's offered for cost out by electrolysis and the huge volumes that could come from areas like Australia or, or North Africa, which really gives this impetus to create an economy wide transition. So, um, what we see is that there will be a multi-technology future. There will be a need for you know, large scale green hydrogen from electrolysis. But increasingly we're seeing inquiries from areas that um, don't have access to the kind of renewable resources that Australia has, um, or has different requirements, you know, uh, which won't be only be able to be met by importing hydrogen. So we see that there will be um, different sectors and different areas that require a mix of low emission technologies and whether that's you know, direct hydrogen import through electrolysis where we you know are really cheering for Australia to play a role whether that's um, the use of hazer at the small local scale um, to more and more focus on capturing you know fugitive methane emissions from um, waste and waste processing um, and making the most of local resources um, or whether that's hazer embedding with large scale industrial processes that produce a lot of waste gas, whether that's um, steel or refining, where there's that waste gas is being produced in the production of their product. And so capturing it and turning it back into their process is a value, um, which can't be done, you know, obviously by uh, electrolysis. So we see all these pieces working together. Um, and it's, it's actually that diversity of technology options and the way that we can use different technologies in different places to drive down the cost of transition, which we actually think means that this is you know, a genuinely sustainable multi-decade investment transition that's happening um, and is unstoppable. So Jeff, Jeff. just following on from um, a, an earlier, uh, I guess, comment you made, and we've actually got a question coming through on the live feed around describing the actual operating temperatures and pressures of the process. Perhaps you can give us a quick overview of what your plant looks like. How, you know, people have got a view in their mind what an electrolysis plant looks like or an SMR plant looks like. Perhaps you could just help people understand size and scale. All right, well, so a HAZER project will look like, um, you know, a small gas 
plant, uh, whether it's a domestic gas plant or you know, or resin plant or, or SMR for that matter. Um, yeah, much of the equipment we use is uh, the same equipment that's used in those processes. So you know, we take um, a methane feed, whether that's biogas or natural gas. Um, if it's biogas, we then condition it to remove the CO2, the sulfur and other impurities to get a relatively pure methane feed to react it. If it's natural gas, we don't have to pre-treat it. But those pre-treatment um, and management um, equipments are the same type which are used in existing gas plants, whether that's sort of mole sieves or amine units or PSA units. Uh, the Hazer reactor itself, um, we're working on a pressurised fluidised bed. Um, we've also, through our uh, previous partnership and collaboration with Mineral Resources, have trialled a mechanical paddle tube reactor. Uh, both of them are well-known chemical process you know, reactor designs. You know, our fluidised bed reactor will have a you know, diameter anywhere up to a couple of metres in diameter in, as we come up in scale from sort of, you know, uh, you know one to three thousand tonne per annum plants to five to ten thousand tonne per annum, tonnes per annum plants. And, you know, will be a number of metres tall, anywhere from maybe seven to eleven metres. Um, you know, we have sort of disclosed that our operating temperature is around about 900 degrees. And we operate at a, a mildly elevated pressure. It's a pressurised fluidised bed reactor you know, operating at around about six bar. So, you know, above atmospheric pressure, but not high pressure, you know, in the world of gas uh, processing. After the reactor, so, you know, our, uh, our solid catalyst is continuously added to the reactor. Um, and that can be through a, any, you know, a number of, you know, proven solids handling facilities like um, screw feeders, for instance. Um, is, is what our initial um, equipment design is. Um, the gas uh, and the catalyst mix, the reaction occurs, and the effluent stream, the exhaust stream from the reactor, is a combination of hydrogen, unreacted methane, and graphite product. And that's then separated through the use of, you know, again, well-recognised equipment, cyclones, Paul, Flin Paul filters, filtered plates, etc. cetera. Um, and then, you know, the graphite is taking off for bagging and handling. Um, and the gas goes through a hydrogen you know, purification unit, a PSA, that's a pressure swing absorption unit, um, to produce the end hydrogen product and a recycle stream, which goes back you know, either to the reactor um, or to generate power uh, for use on site. So, you know, walking through a hazer plant in the future you know, to um, most people that will look like you know, any other piece of industrial equipment, you know, there will be um, you know, solids handling facility, there will be you know, screw feeders for the catalyst, there will be a you know, reactor and furnace you know, package, which will be sort of you know, obviously insulated and you know, look just like a large cylinder from the outside. Um, and there'll be compressors, you know, pressure swing absorption and, and the usual sort of safety equipment, control valves, PSVs, etc., associated with the gas plant. Jeff, just sort of moving away from the technology now, I'm, I'm really interested to learn more about your commercialization process. You know, from the very earliest days, you know, in university research, like what are the phases you've been along that journey, you know, grants and other assistance you've, you've, um, you've received and any advice on others who are wanting to go down the same sort of path? Okay, yeah. So I think we've been through a, what I describe as a rigorous but standard technology development process. So you know, the process started with primary research, as so many of these ideas do, uh, which was funded by the University of Western Australia as part of their, you know, uh, their research program. And that created the initial Hazer concept and the very initial Hazer sort of patents and IP. Um, the university took that IP and put it into a special purpose company. So I think Hazer originally was a PTY limited company. Um, you know, as you know, I guess is now uh, very much best practice amongst universities in trying to identify how they can then commercialize um, the effort to their research. Um, the next step was initial seed capital raising, which uh, funded some pre-commercial research, some further research at UWA to take that initial IP and and do some you know, proving in very small uh, bench top lab scale reactors. And then there was uh, an initial IPO which supported further desktop research um, and our pilot program, um, where the activities initially moved to the University of Sydney with whom we've still got a research partnership ongoing. Um, and um, the piloting was originally in Sydney before relocating to Quinana, to the mineral resources site of Quinana, that's in Western Australia for East Coast viewers. Um, so if you think about it, that's fairly standard. Primary research, pre-commercial and desktop work, then piloting. 
And we're now in the process of designing, procuring, fabricating um, the first uh, commercial demonstration site. It's a demonstration project. It'll be a 100 tonne per annum hydrogen production facility. It'll co-produce around about 375 tonnes per annum of graphite. And we're working in collaboration with the Water Corporation, you know, the government owned enterprise in Western Australia that provides uh, water and sewerage services to the city of Perth and, and surrounds. And so we've, um, they've been very uh, supportive and positive about allowing us to co-locate at their Woodman Point wastewater treatment facility. And we're gonna take biogas that's generated from their solids handling facility and is currently going to flare and use that as the seed of this first you know, scaled up uh, continuously operating demonstration uh, of our technology. Um, the second half, so you know, that was the first half of the question, what are the stages? So primary research, desktop uh, laboratory work, um, continually desktop work in parallel with piloting, and now a demonstration phase before um, revenue producing projects we hope next. In terms of funding, then obviously the initial research was funded through the university sector. Um, there was then some seed capital. Um, since then, yeah, we've continued to fund our research and development through um, our shareholders' equity um, and through our listing on the ASX. But we've also received um, you know, significant support from governments, both state and federal. So uh, we're the recipient of an ARENA grant, which is a material you know, major contributor to the funding of our uh, commercial demonstration project. Um, we've also, uh, our ongoing R&D program, uh, we maintain a, a core team of four postdoctoral researchers at the University of Sydney, um, and that's funded by ourselves, but also part funded through um, the CRC program. So we, we achieve, we have government support through there. Um, and we've also seen support through various state government, particularly West Australian state government, um, national hydrogen uh, development strategy and development funds in through things like a feasibility study we've undertaken into looking at a refueling hub in Mandra. So there's been a sort of a, a broad set of funding. Um, the third part of your question, which was an advice for others, um, probably takes a bit of thinking. I guess the one is to sort of you know, build that diversity of funding if, you, if you're thinking about it from an entrepreneurial perspective. But I think the, you know, the other piece of advice would be the importance of that you know, genuine deep science and, and technology that makes it work. Um, that you know, we've really built on some really strong work that our universities have done. Um, and can, that continues to be important to us now. So while we're pursuing the HAZER process, we've got a uh, evolving R&D program that's really focusing on how we add value to this unique graphite. So you know, we've continued to undertake research into both understanding the characteristics, classification and and how we understand the performance of the graphite material we produce, because it's slightly different from other graphites. All graphite species are unique, we've, we're rapidly finding. Um, and now we're looking at R&D into innovative ways to upgrade that to battery grade uh, material um, in clean ways with the view to producing you know, clean graphite as well as clean hydrogen. And so what are the biggest sort of challenges or sticking points that are sort of before you now as you go to the demonstration project and beyond? Well, I guess technically and physically, it's the challenge of upscaling an industrial process. Um, and it's sort of easy to say in concept and hard to do in practice as, as many other you know, engineering organisations have found. Um, and so you know, we're building a, a first of its kind you know, project. You know, the pilot showed you know, really positive results, which gave us the confidence to go into this. But we've now got to upscale it and integrate all of the systems, operating systems, safety systems, you know, control systems to show that we can manage you know, high temperature gas process and a solid catalyst and product you know, all at once continuously. So you know, there's a significant engineering and operations challenge. Um, and you know, I think that that's you know, normal for any sort of industrial innovation. You know, it's very different from creating a FinTech app or a um, social media platform. You know, it's a different type of innovation. You eventually have to test it in the real physical world, not, not a virtual world. And it's not um, something that you know, Australia has done that well. So yeah, I hope that you can crack that nut and be very successful. Um, I, I certainly hope so. And I'd certainly sort of you know, shout out to the quality of sort of the engineering and operations here. I mean, Australia's got a great base, whether it's in companies like Darren's you know, and Insect Pivot, whether it's like all of the engineers who provide support to our LNG industry, our iron ore industry, um, uh, you know, our ammonia um, fertilizers and um, an explosives industry. I mean, 
I think one of the things that's overlooked is just how strong the engineering and, and operations base in Australia is. We may be, you know, subscale compared to the, you know, the Saudis or the Gulf of Mexico's of this world, but you know, Australian engineering capability and ability to run you know, complex um, industrial operations, I think is really well recognised and it's probably something we should try and make more of. I agree. All right, I muted myself. Amen, Jeff. There's no argument to you. Um, so I think you mentioned earlier around the, I guess, the funding process and where you've been to really interested thinking more broadly about you know how we uh, we work through the energy transition and these new innovative technologies what are some key roadblock roadblocks and things that you you know you'd like to see happen whether it's in western australia or you know more broadly nationally in australia um i think yeah the key is for uptake um i mean i think australia and we're probably a great example of it is punches pretty heavily above our weight in bringing forward innovation um you know, Hayes are listed on the ASX, got shareholder support very early in its life, um, and shareholders have continued to support it, and for which you know, we're extremely grateful. Um, technology is maturing really rapidly and, and will solve many of these problems, whether that's you know, the improved scale of electrolysis being demonstrated by people like Andrew and the Pilbara Energy Hub, you know, whether it's the push for green ammonia being led by companies like yourselves, but at some point, We've got to mention the unmentionable, that's policy. And we actually have to you know, bite the bullet and start um, creating some frameworks for customer incentives. You know, and I, I reflect here on the incredible success the Australian renewable energy industry has had. You know, that started with a 1% renewable energy target, which became three, which became 20, which we achieved. And we achieved cost savings that would, would never have been dreamed of um, through building scale and experience in our supply chain. So, you know, there's an enormous amount of innovation going on, whether it's universities, whether it's small companies and entrepreneurs and startups like ourselves, whether it's, you know, large companies from you know, Fortescue and they're pushed into Fortescue Future Industries, you know, through to manufacturers. Um, but at some point, there has to be a decision to put in place some market mechanisms and incentives, you know, you know a price on carbon that will actually crystallise this demand that everyone is saying wants to be out there. Um, and we'll really see cost improvements in this sector through deployment as well as technology. You know, technology can you know, improve your cost and bring forward options to a certain point, but the big changes come with deployment because that's where you get wide scale, scale uptake of skills. That's why you get broad familiarity that you know, reduces the, you know, the friction, the cost of getting someone to try something for the first time. And also, as we've seen in you know, uptake of whether it's gas or renewables, you know, reduces the cost of finance as it becomes just an accepted another sector. So, you know, uh, that's the, the piece that we're all tiptoeing around a bit at the moment. It's well and good to have an, you know, national strategies and 2050 targets. But if we don't start soon putting in the, mechani the me mechanisms in to incentivize the first customers, then we run the risk of stalling at the starting gate and, and missing a great economic opportunity. Mm. Now, one, one final question from me, Jeff, before maybe Julian reads out some of the audience questions. So the Ammonia Energy Association has a particular focus uh, or interest in the potential of ammonia to move beyond you know, fertilizers and explosives to ammonia energy, uh, and particularly as a traded product. Do, do you see potential for the Hazer technology to produce hydrogen that could end up in ammonia? Or do you think there are other niches where it sort of where it really plays stronger? Uh, certainly the potential is there. Um, you know, anything that diversifies the potential supply of, of, of low carbon hydrogen will, you know, will, will support the objective you've just described. You know, so we're part of sort of, you know, the push factors, if you like. Um, I think the big question, you know, the way to answer the question is, you know, in the short term, you know, we're an emerging technology. So, you know, we're building a 100 tonne per annum plant and, you know, we have an aspiration, you know, in, in the next phase to build, you know, plants for you know, a couple of thousand tonnes per annum where we start to reach some, you know, initial um, scale that, that will produce revenue and, um, you know, earn us an operating profit. Um, obviously, you know, ammonia is an industry which uh, has many zero, more zeros behind your capacity needs, right? So, you know, a 5,000 tonne per annum hydrogen supply would be a massive step and scale up for us and would be a, 
yeah, a, a small pilot for for a proven industry like like ammonia. So yeah, we've obviously got a couple of steps to get through till our scale aspirations meet your needs. Um, but you know, you know, all technology started that way. You know, we're, we're following the path of you know risk out, scale up. You know, followed by you know refining, LNG, you know previous hydrogen production technologies and ammonia itself. So I'm sure those two will intersect at some point in the future. Mm, thanks, Jeff. Now I might hand back to Julian uh, to read out some of the uh, questions from the audience in the remaining time. Sure thing. Thank you all very much for that. Really, really interesting. We've got some specific, really technical questions, which we might, we might try and get as much information as we can offline and try and answer those. Um, we've gone through a little bit of it today. Um, one thing uh, Venkat has brought up is what's the similarities between Hazer's process and uh, monolith materials in Canada? And is there any relationship or? Um, so there's, first off, there's no relationship between Hazer and monolith. Um, monolith would be, um, I think, best described as a competing technology. Um, my understanding of monolith is you know they produce an amorphous carbon um, which is different from hazes and they use a different type of catalyst so they've taken a, a, a different approach they're probably slightly further down the path on us they're further into building a larger cost project than, than hazer is um, but the focus of that project seems to be carbon black production with you know, with hydrogen as a sideline um, so they tend to you know I, I would see that they you know even in their um, branding and naming you know they're focused on carbon materials where hydrogen is the byproduct and i'm not sure that we're not slightly focused the other way um but you know monolith materials are another example of the you know, methane pyrolysis that uh, technology that is trying to become developed you know, as a hazer um we think there's some advantages in our process in terms of um you know simplicity so for the long run you know operating cost savings at a large scale and we think there's some values, uh, some value benefits to us in the, the different type of carbon we produce versus monoliths. Um, but we're watching with them interest and we wish them well. Lovely. Um, and a question, a pre question from uh, Jürgen, who's looking at the energy difference between methane pyrolysis or steam methane reforming. And he's asking if there's a magic number for the cost of, of uh, renewable energy the difference between your pyrolysis process and a traditional process makes sense or stacks up as a business case okay um which is a an interesting question um i don't think there's a single magic number because there's sort of a number of competing factors you know the cost of gas versus the cost of power um you know there's locations where gas is expensive and power is expensive there's other locations where gas is expensive and power is cheap um, and there's some locations where gas is cheap, but power is expensive. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a, you know, there's various trade-offs. Um, the endotherm in our reaction is actually, you know, slightly lower than the endotherm in steam methane reforming, but we don't get the added benefit of the production from the gas water shift. Um, so, you know, we will use, you know, probably slightly more energy uh, to produce hydrogen is correct. But on the other hand, we then achieve a saleable byproduct, um, and we have a lower cost catalyst, um, but we do have a continuously you know, regenerating and consuming catalyst. So there's actually a complex set of trade-offs. You know, um, you know, we're not as cheap as steam methane reforming today. Um, and you know, that reflects the maturity of the process. Um, you know, steam methane reforming has had you know, 30, 40 years of development, has many hundreds of projects and has come from small scale projects right up to large scale projects. You know, that's a, a cost out process that we're gonna have to follow. Um, so but no, there isn't a single magic number. There's a number of you know, trade-offs and, and complexity, which will sort of answer the competing economics in each different location. Wonderful, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, we might call it there. Um, I will send you the rest of the questions though, and I will try to get as much publicly available information of you as possible for our attendees to provide to them about your process. But really, really good to hear about this. And like you said, it's really interesting to see how your journey is going to go from here. So thank you. It's lovely. Right, thank you very much. Beautiful. Um, but thank you very much to our presenters. Thank you very much to our audience for coming. Um, coming up next month, uh, we've got Felicity Underhill, uh, General Manager of the Future Fuels Division at Origin Energy. 
Uh, we've heard a lot of interesting announcements out of Origin this year about how they plan to approach their high decarbonisation journey. And Felicity is going to join us to explore some of these and also give us a sense of how ammonia and hydrogen fit into Origin's plans. Uh, so mark it in your diaries. Thursday, May 27th at 2 p.m. AEST. Everyone who registered for this event will get a link in their inboxes. We'll promote it through our usual channels and we hope you can all attend. And as a reminder, please feel free to email us any questions or suggestions you have about ammonia energy and we'll try to tailor these upcoming webinars accordingly. We appreciate the feedback and we appreciate all the questions today. So thank you very much and we'll sign off for the April edition of Ammonia Energy Live. Thank you really, really much, Andrew, Jeff, and also Darren. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.